Good afternoon, everybody. Ooh, that's loud. <laughs> um, it's probably a good idea to find your seat. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. And I'm so glad to see such a great crowd of people. This is an exciting event. Thanks, everybody, for coming. So find a seat, and um, I'll figure out what's going on with a microphone over there, and uh, we'll get going in a minute. It works. We're going to get going just a few minutes early. We see our speaker up there in the screen. This is, it's, remote is just a wonderful thing, isn't it? We are, we are very lucky to have uh, Professor Hubka joining us. We're sad that he couldn't be here in person, but when he made the offer of doing remote, we said, yes, please. So we are lucky and blessed to be able to do this. So my name is Katie Murphy. I'm president of North Yarmouth Historical Society. And for those who have never been here in this building, welcome to North Yarmouth's West Custico Hall and Community Center. Um, this community center opened to really great acclaim and happiness here in the town in late 2020. So think about that, late 2020, right? <laughs> Not a few months after, there was just nothing going on in this building, and how sad we all were, because it's a beautiful facility meant to serve lots and lots of people and lots of fun events. And we made it through the pandemic, and here we are on the other side, and there's, I just can't believe um, how many activities go on here in North Yarmouth's community center. Um, I I urge you to take a look online to see what we do have going because there's something for everyone. There's a lot, there's a beautiful gym and there's um, other programs um, both outside and inside. We'll be having an outdoor market here in the summertime. Um, so please come on by. Um, so I've got some thanks here and probably thanks especially to the community center's staff, Mary, Jackson, and Jackie, who have worked hard to make this event happen, and so many others here. And thanks to our volunteer refreshments crew, we had some really delicious stuff, and I hope everybody has enjoyed some lemonade and some baked goods and savory treats. So thank you all to those who contributed. And they came from all different historical societies. Representing Pownall, especially today, we have Craig Dietrich and Jonna White. What, guys want to raise your hands? Yay! <laughs> and representing Skyline, we have Jen Robbins. Want to raise your hand? And, and others too, right? Yep. Lynn Young, thank you for coming. Um, representing Cumberland, uh, we have Linda Jensen and her two sisters. I didn't know. There's like these three sisters. And they all live in Cumberland. And they're all involved in the Historical Society. All power to them. <laughs> and we have Betsy Langer here from Yarmouth Historical Society, too. Thank you, Betsy. And representing North Yarmouth Historical Society, we've got Mark Heath, Dixie Hayes, Sandy Burnell, and myself, Katie Murphy. Who have I forgotten? Joy Malloy. Raise your hands. Yeah? And Keith Bublow is on our program committee, so we are blessed to have many volunteers. Thank you. Um, and just out of curiosity, raise your hand if you're from Pownall. Whoa. <laughs> raise your hand if you're, you're um, associated with North Yarmouth and Skyline. Wow. <laughs> 
How about Yarmouth? Got Yarmouth folks here? Yay. <laughs> um, and did I say Cumberland? Cumberland. All right. Good. Great representation from all, um, um, all towns. Thank you so much. So with that introduction, I just want to remind everybody that we are all connected. We're all part of ancient North Yarmouth. We were the plantation of North Yarmouth back in 1680, encompassing lands from Cumberland to Harpswell and including Muir Point. And towns split off one by one. Harpswell started it in 1758, and Freeport, Pownall, and Cumberland followed. Yarmouth was the last to secede, and let's not forget that Shebeeg Island seceded from Yarmouth in 2007. So... <laughs> Oh, from Cumberland, pardon me, Cumberland, in 2007. So we are, we are connected in many ways historically. Um, and if you want to read more about past history, um, check out the books on the various tables. We've got some really delicious, wonderful historical literature there. So connections continue, and I hope they grow stronger. So we, we look forward to collaborating with all the other organizations that are here today. And if you have an idea about collaboration or a program that could happen, talk to um, some of the representatives here um, at the different tables and let us know. And then a pitch for North Yarmouth Historical Society. Um, we successfully moved our 1853 old townhouse to a new location right in the middle of developing North Yarmouth. And even though the building's interior still isn't quite complete, we couldn't resist getting programs going there. And the only reason we're not there for this program is we didn't think we'd be able to fit everybody. And when I look around, I know that that's the case. Um, so keep an eye out for all programs that are combined great historical societies. And a big plug for Cumberland, you guys are having a scavenger hunt tomorrow, right? Oh boy, there's all kinds of things going on. So, now to introduce our speaker, Professor Thomas Hubka. There he is. Hey, Tom. <laughs> He's the Professor Emeritus at the School of Architecture at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and he's been a teacher for 40 years and at Wisconsin for 20. And throughout 40 years of teaching, he continues to link architecture to culture. And he's worked on topics including New England farms, bungalows, ranch houses, and workers' cottages. Big house, little house, back house, barn, the connected farm buildings of New England, was Professor Hubka's first book. And it has been in continuous publication for almost 40 years. It's a scholarly and popular standard for New England architecture history and cultural studies. But Tom's also written about 18th century, an 18th century Polish wooden synagogue um, with a book called Resplendent Synagogue, Architecture and Worship in an 18th century Polish community. I don't get how he does these incredibly different cultural things, but obviously he's got that kind of fascination that brings him to different historical things. His latest book is called How the Working Class Home Became Modern, 1900 to 1940. And it's about working class housing in America, how American families obtain improved housing during the late 1800s and early 1900s. Duplexes, multi-flats, modest single family homes, remodeled houses, sound kind of familiar modern day kind of stuff going on here in Maine. So I'm, I'm amazed that he's picked up on that history and we're pushing it forward by what's going on today. Um, so Tom lives in Portland, Oregon. He teaches at the University of Oregon and at Portland State University and Portland Community College. But he returns to, doing, to New England each summer to lecture and enjoy life at his brother's connected farm in Bridgeton, Maine. So it's, it was really wonderful to spend time planning this with Tom um, online. And he, was, he felt very sad to not, not to be here because a lot of his research was centered right here in this area. 
Um, and one thing that he very nicely has done for us is he duplicated one of his beautiful drawings, which is up here at the front table. And there's one, there's a hundred of them, so I think there's probably one for everyone. Um, and thank you, Tom, for that. There's also his books for sale as well. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce him. So Tom, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katie. Uh, th and th thank you, uh, uh, people from uh, North Yarmouth and 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 around surrounding. Um, it it's wonderful to come come back here. Uh, it this really is is a homecoming for me, um, classically, I guess, you know, in, in terms of the farms that that I looked at. Um, uh, in my in my book, I, I I cite about ten farms in, in North Yarmouth and and Yarmouth, and I'll just quickly uh, read the historical names. I don't know, Marston Lawrence Farm, Orastus True Farm, Hamilton House, Jacob Chase House, Staples House, um, Ephraim Andrews House, the, the Baston Farm, the Bacon Farm. Uh, that's the one on the uh, North Yarmouth to Gray Road, um, crest of the hill. Uh, Burt Hamilton Farm, and I also have pictures uh, uh, that I'll show you um, uh, during during the talk. Um, I lived in Bridgeton, Maine, as I did the research, but for various reasons, um, uh, I emphasized uh, the houses in, in your area. Um, I also would like to, to uh, thank and to recognize the, uh, the work of, of your um, Ursula Bayer. Um, she was the historian who helped me, actually helped me uh, think historically. Um, and uh, she, she, our, a tremendous loss historically uh, for, for you guys, um, but uh, she helped me and uh, you'll see the product of, of, of some of her labors uh, uh, here. Um, uh, so I've been to not to be to this in person, um, doctor's orders, but I'm you know I'm okay. But I, he didn't want me to get excited as as you'll see me getting excited here. Um, uh, I also sorry that I missed the uh, the the, uh, the treats that you've laid out. I always like to do that before I talk, but I I, I missed I missed that too. Um, I guess that's uh, that's it. Okay. Um, uh, here's my book on on this. Do you see this on the screen? Uh, uh, Katie, is this uh, my book? Um, okay. Uh, also, Katie, do you see my cursor? We didn't go through this, but does, do you see this? Can you answer? Okay. Well, um, uh, can I use this, Katie? Yes. Yeah, I get on the screen now. Okay, see the cursor okay. and we uh, see you. Okay, yep. I'll point things out with using this sometimes. Thanks. Um, uh, this is my first book. Uh, some people have uh, kids. Um, I have books, uh, and this is Junior, and Junior's done pretty well. He's 40 years. Um, also, about 60,000 uh, copies, uh, which is which is pretty good for a, an old farm book and all that. So I'm uh, I'm proud, um, and it it tells your story, North, North Yarmouth. Um, I'm not, there it is. Okay, fine. All set. Big house, little house, back house, barn. Um, this is a phrase I, I picked up uh, uh, starting when I started uh, doing, uh, talking about this um, uh, 50 years ago uh, uh, or so, <laughs> a long, long time ago. When I first started out, a young architecture professor, I, I didn't, I didn't know a lot, but I, I, I was, um, Excited about your your, your farmsteads. Um, some talks in Granges uh, back then. Many of you, uh, I forget if you have a Grange or not. Uh, agricultural associations uh, they've disappeared a lot in the twentieth twenty first century. Um, but I, I gave talks there um, at, a, at a few um, uh, in Maine, and I would ask the question at these talks in the Grange. I, I would say, Have any of you heard the expression "big house, little house, back house, barn"? And always uh, in the back of the room, the people usually by the cookies or the women who made the food, a couple of the oldest women would raise their hands. These were women who were children at the turn of the century uh, when I when I talked to them there. And I said, yes, uh, we we know that expression. We we had childhood games. We did a couple of childhood. But the one game that came up 
most often was the where are you going to get married game. Now, some of you might already be able to smile and understand this one. Are you going to get married in the big house, the little house, the back house, or the barn? Where are you going to get married? And it's where you land. I don't know, skip rope, you jump, and, and you land and all that. Um, so are you going to get married in the big house? Well, there were weddings in the big house. This is the, the, the parlor of, of, of main farms, and some weddings are there, maybe. Uh, the, the, the little house, which is the kitchen, well, that's not so good. But the barn with the animals, are you going to get married there? But the most well, worst or most funny one was, are you going to get married in the back house? Now, did any of you see the humor uh, of this uh, 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 half a century ago? Um, the back house is where the outhouse, the eight holer or the two holer or, or whatever you, you have there. So, you know, go, you know, that was that was the point. And interestingly, the childhood ditty, this big house, the back house boy, you might it, it sounds to my scholarly friends, it sounds like something made up. And well, it was by kid. Lab. But here the kids landed on the right logic. Sometimes they do that and, and they, they get it right. There are four components to the which I'm going to show you of these connected forms. And their little poem, as I hope these little girls are are, are reciting uh, in Kenny, early 19th century uh, poetry from Kenny Bunk. I hope they're saying big house, little house, and, and twirling around uh, doing that. I've got a lot of pictures of connected farms. Um, most of you don't need an explanation of what that is, but it, but let's say there's someone from away uh, out in the audience there. What we have here is the arrangement of buildings where you have a front house and a whole other buildings and out to the barn and they're all connected together and interestingly although that occurs continuously they really look different look at those six pictures there and it goes on and on and they're different each farmer arranging their buildings slightly differently but all adopting the same formula of, of uh, uh, doing their farmsteads so that's what we're that's what we're going to talk about I started out um, again, a, a young uh, scholar, uh, architect, uh, 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 wishy-tailed, and, and uh, wanting to learn about uh, New England landscape and all that. I was I grew up in the suburbs of Jersey, so I didn't know this stuff. So I get to places like this and and other ones, and uh, I would do the research, and but I couldn't get a connected farm to be very old. In other words, we know this house is about eighteen oh five or something like that, and but the barns are newer. And I couldn't get an old connected farm. I mean, old meaning, you know, the 17th, 18th century or something like that, because presumably this would have come over with the English and percolated a while in Massachusetts Bay, and then it comes up here and uh, to Maine and all that. But I couldn't, I, I thought, there's something, made, am, I, am I missing something? Or maybe I'm just picking new, new, new connected farms and all that, because they, they, they weren't old. The connection wasn't old. But gradually, after a while, I, I started to see, and, and it's it's. I saw what, what is in this photo down here. I, I, I this was on the mantle of this house over there, and I said, and I started to study it. These barns in this photo. This is the Nevers Bennett Farm, uh, one of the big farms in in Sweden, Maine. These these barns are from the house. It doesn't look that way, but but they were. We we know that and all that. And then at some point, it became connected. Uh, the light, the light goes on. Uh, all of a sudden, oh, connected. The connection of these places isn't so old. You know, it was rather new relative to you know four hundred years of uh, of Yankee farmers in New England or all that. Were new. That that didn't seem right. So, so what I discovered, and the heart of my research, is painstaking uh, recording of existing places. You know, uh, I, I have scholarly friends who I said I think are brilliant and all that, but that doesn't include me. But I'm persistent, and um, one of the things that I do uh, and did it was to record over and over farms. It just was a history recording them, and this is what I generally found. This is the Nevers Bennett farm again, and there's an early pioneering stage. You've heard about that, the early pioneer log cabin or whatever, and they do the first barn, and then they they grow buildings out from them and all that, and then they get connected together. And this, this sequence happened over and over and over again. And so that sort of tipped it off to what's going on here and all that. So 
with that in mind, I start uh, going out and researching New England and, and, and all that to try to figure, figure all this out. Um, um, so uh, what you see here is that it is, and what happened here is that um, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, well, I, I don't have, sorry. So, so um, uh, they got connected um, at some point. And so what I did was, as professors usually do, is they concoct a theory. And that between about before 1850, there were no connected farms. And all of the connected farms that we know were connected together in a 50 year period between about 1850 to 1900, 50 years. Okay. That's, and that happened over and over again. And I think that's true today after doing lots of other research about that. So that's out there. Um, uh, I speculate about that. One of the things you do as a professor, you speculate about um, uh, movements and forces of history and all that, and the agrarianism and Bolshevism or whatever it is. But what you really want to do is also put real people behind your theory, okay? And so behind this theory, we're real people, and I think I can do that. And so for this farm that I've shown you here, the Nevers Bennett, this is Charles and, and uh, Charlotte. They get married about the, before the Civil War about, and Charles comes into this family, and they do a real modeling here. They take down the old kitchen and put up a new kitchen L. They take the stable that was off in the side over here, and they, they drag it into line and connect it to the house. They disassemble the old English barns, and they disassemble barn and put it together, and they connect a farm, okay? This is what happened. This is what average and richer and average farmers uh, did over and over again. Um, so uh, this is the consistent story that, that I, I found over again. I tell the story to, to my students, and, and, and they're smart and all that, but, but <laughs> they're not farmers. And um, so one of the things I say is that, well, I could be pulling your leg, really. You know, this is this is Charles and Charlotte, but do you really think that that, that guy and that woman are, are farmers, farm couple or something like that, really? So I, I say, well, to look carefully. And I say, well, look at look at this. Uh, look at Charles here. Why do you why, what should, what about him tells you really that he's a farmer? And they kind of smile and I don't know, his beard or something like that. OK. Any of you out there? Are you looking closely? Look at his hands. You ever shake a uh, hand with a real farmer? Sometimes I've done that in the past and all that. And you shake it, and, and I say to myself, is this guy wearing a glove? And I look down on his hand. It's swollen, okay? It, it's usually enlarged a little bit and all that. 50 years of, 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 of busting uh, of rocks um, and dragging, making rock walls and working on machinery. That's what happens to your hand. Anyway, Charles is a farmer. He made those connected farms in that in this period over there, as did hundreds and thousands of other farmers in, in New England. And so we got to this point, and we always get to this point in, in my talks and all that. And so I look at the audience and say, as, as you'd expect, did northern New England farmers, like Charles and Charlotte, connect their houses and their barns together? And I ask you, okay? And you know, just as God made green apples, which is a kind of farmer expression that I pick up and use a lot, okay? The story that I think we can embellish a little bit is during the, the cold, bitter winters of New England, when it's like zero outside and all that, wise and crafty New England farmers found that connecting their buildings together would afford a passage between the house and the barn in the winter. It's a tight, tight story, isn't it? Now, I bet some of you city folks out there, most of us mean that way. I grew up in Jersey in the suburbs, and I, I, me too. Sounds like a pretty good answer, okay? It was also told to me by farmers, too, who weren't city, weren't city folks and all that. And there's this reason for that, too, and I'll conclude with, with, with that and all that. But just for some of you out there, I know, you know I'm a professor, and I got theories and all that. you got to watch out for guys like that. But... Let's take this theory apart. So uh, you can be skeptical. You know, you don't have to don't leave until you know. I I'll I'll listen to you and all that. But now I'm going to try to amass some facts or some you know some situations about trying to answer why did they connect their their house and the barn together. 
Okay, let's let's go. The first one here is on. This is a map of New England, and here we are in North Yarmouth. Okay, do you see who we're? You know, and by the way, you know, this is about the center of the connected farm universe. You know, and you've been here, and I'm telling you that. Okay, it's just because I've I've. It's just a my con a center of my connected farm universe and all that. But anyway, it's right in the center of connected farms. And this is the connected farms in New England. And this is where they are. And then outside of this, there aren't any connected farms. For some of you, that should be a surprise. Not like if it was such a good idea, well, of course, it would be done by other farmers in other parts of the country. No. Okay. This is the amount of connected farms in the universe, okay? Right here in America, over there. Now, for some of you, I gotta bracket this and say, I know the European traditions. I've been to European countries and none of the agriculture of Europeans, and then they have some connected farms in some medieval eras. I can do that. I can do the English history too, but let's just talk about America. No other connected farms in America outside that zone. How come? We're, we're main farmers just, in New England farmers just, more intelligent, <laughs> or we get cold more than other people? Hmm. I don't know. The one thing I do know is that people started leaving Maine and going west in about 18, well, 1800 or, and, and beyond that, um, uh, after 18, more of 1812, and they start leaving. And farmers like this farmer from Vermont here, who went to Genesee Valley, Genesee Valley uh, area um, near Buffalo, okay, he made a farm and he built like he built in New England, in Vermont, disconnected. And farmers who left New England did not connect to farms in any other area of the country. That should be surprising. And the more you know about farmers, that should really be surprising because one of the things about farmers is they don't invent things from scratch or something like that. They build their, their farms if they settle in new areas like they did in the old country or, or the previous place. When German farm, farmers come to America, what do they do? They build German farms and, and barns, okay? Okay, just as God made green apples. They, but New Englanders did, didn't do Well, how come? Basically, they didn't have connected farms when they streamed out of New England in the early periods. If they were leaving after the Civil War, they could, but you never, you know, start something from scratch anyway. So think about that. So professors have to have theories. So here's the here is the theory now. So between 1850 to 1900, all connected, 99% of connected farms were built. One or two before, maybe, or we don't know. Didn't build connected farms after that. It was just nobody was building after 1900. Anyway, all the connected farms, just say 50 year zone. Did it get colder? I can tell you that. I, I've I've read the meteorological studies. They didn't get colder. Some of you know about the uh, the winter, um, uh, the the long winter uh, of uh, and froze to death, uh, 18, 1816 or eighteen twelve, eighteen sixteen. Or this isn't the same time. Okay, um, there was no meteorolo meteor meteorological glacial period or anything like that. Didn't get cold. Did the, did the main farmers in New Vermont and New Hampshire Park, did they get colder? <laughs> no, 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 they didn't get colder or anything like that. There was other things going on. Okay, so be careful about the snow theory. Okay, big house, little house, back house, barn. I'm going to take this apart now. We're going to see the component parts, and I'm going to, uh, and I'm going to talk about each part, and we're going to put it together to tell the story of why New England farmers made connected farms. So first, the big house. This is the front house. The house is here. If you're, uh, if you're from away, you need an explanation about this, but if you're local, you guys know this. Okay, so the house in the front over here, look, this is the, the, the big house. Let's talk about that first. There's two eras of big houses generally in, in New England and in um, North Yarmouth and other places. And that is a, a pre-1800 phase where you you build buildings like you did in England and you continue them in America for years. Here's, here's New England's most popular, uh, one of the most popular houses, the Cape or Cape Cod house or, or something like that. It has heavy timber construction. These are big timbers, okay? And it has... A, a center chimney, in this case, center chimneys, but it's fireplaces. Okay, so this 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 house was built comfortably or well for two hundred years, and then, about in about eighteen twenty thirty or so, if you built a new house after that, you built a different kind of house. It may look the same in kind of the form, the massing of that, 
we call this a side hall. This is one of New England's most popular houses. You've got a lot of them here um, in town. I have one, I, I diagram one in my book. Um, when you open that door, you got a staircase going up, uh, parlor to the left over here. When you see a small, narrow chimney like that, that's a stove chimney. So it changed from fireplaces to stoves. Okay, and that's one of the big technological developments uh, here uh, in New England. Um, it also, this is also built with um, balloon frame construction, uh, smaller stick construction as a big stick construction, big change. So a lot of big changes going on. That's going on when they build connected farms. That's the big house. The little house. The little house is the second building, that's a kitchen. Kitchen is the most important place on the farm, any farm, you know, in Jakarta, <laughs> Indonesia, or uh, Bolivia, or whatever. The kitchen is, is, is the center uh, of the farm. This is the second building. And this occurs in the second building because all over New England, after about 200 years, and then uh, a little chart a little before, people started to move the kitchen, which had always been located in the big house, out into what we now know as the kitchen now. Most other parts of the country do the same thing, but they don't call it an L. L, okay, that's that's what you guys call it. So a kitchen L. And so if you have started out with a small house, you made a big one, but then the kitchen goes into this house. And by 1840, if you were building a new house, you built a big house and a little house. And so the, it's the development of the kitchen L. You can see this is going toward big house, little house, back house, wide. So it's, it's part of this process of of moving in that direction, uh, the kitchen L uh, development. The kitchen is, uh, it's the place of the farm life in many ways. And you get, you get a Courier Ives type uh, of photo of, of Thanksgiving celebration or whatever it is. The reality of the kitchen L might be a little more grim. I, I love this picture. This is um, uh, South Paris, Maine, but it's uh, someone going out to the well in 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 the uh, in the heart of winter uh, for water. Uh, nothing romantic about uh, the kitchen L there. So anyway, uh, different stories about the kitchen L. But the heart of the kitchen L on the inside is improvement and of the in the nineteenth century, and so that is what this story is about. And so what we see here is an improved. So here we see a stove. This is the heart of improvement uh, during the nineteenth century. Maine and uh, New Hampshire and Vermont farmers um, get a stove between about 1820 to about 1850 or so. It is, if you had a, didn't have a stove by the Civil War, you were really old or poor or whatever, you had a stove. So the stove's there. But look at this. What's this behind the stove right here? That's a fireplace. And the fireplace got covered in and the stove put in front of it. Happened over and hundreds and thousands of times. Well, just out of sight, you can just see it over here is a pump. It's, and getting water into the kitchen was a high priority for farm farm uh, wives uh, during the uh, 19th century. And there's a couple ways to do that. A pump with a, a cistern in the basement, fed by the gutter system, rainwater, uh, hydraulic ram in the pasture, a pump, uh, or a pump kind of system. Uh, there are other, uh, uh, windmills uh, later on and things like that. that you got to get water into the house for, for modern people. And they were expanding. Linoleum. On, on a farmhouse kitchen floor. They, now, some of my architectural friends smile a little bit with linoleum. It's kind of 50s-ish and all that, and all that. A piece of linoleum on a farmhouse kitchen floor means that you could be clean. Underneath that is a kitchen floor that you swept and you could never get clean. Anyway, these guys are modernizing. And this is, this is farm modernization in the L when, during the time they made connected farms. So uh, my story is gonna be about one of modernization Although the connected farm doesn't seem like it's a modernization thing. Let me give me some time. Uh, to a summary story about the kitchen L, um, about, about how it helps, is told here. I love this uh, picture story that, that I'm going to tell you now. And here we see uh, a woman. Um, do you see how she's smiling? Look closely. Okay. Now, it isn't a big toothy selfie grin or anything like that. No, this is New England. Okay. So, but she is smiling. He is warm. And she's warm because. There's a parlor stove here. So that's one word for this space, a parlor. But what's this space used to be? Look at this. What is this? What am I outlining? That's a fireplace opening. It's filled in and all that. And that's where the, 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 the parlor stove uh, goes. It goes into that place and all that. But that, that is a fireplace. 
fireplace. Much more important is a fireplace to what room? It's the kitchen. Why the kitchen? When you see a fireplace of this size, it usually has an oven or something like that. It's the fireplace for a kitchen. 99.9% .9 of the time and all that. It, it was a kitchen or something like that. It's been converted like we have here. So she converts this to a parlor. And so finally she's warm as opposed to being um, uh, spending her whole life in front of the warm, warm on the face side, cold on the back side and all that. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, uh, 19, early 19th century uh, Maine uh, uh, kitchen life. And through that, that door, through that door is the entrance to the kitchen L where the new kitchen is located. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times this happened to buildings that were built before 19, no, sorry, 18, 20 or 30 or something like that in your town, uh, many of them. Back house. Back house is the third. Uh, now, it can be one building, like this is a classic kind of big house, little house, back house, but you know, they're all different. Uh, the way they go. So here's the back house. The back house will be in a building, one unit between house and barn, and the kitchen, the little house is here, and the back house is here. This is the Hupka farm in, in um, uh, Bridgeton. Uh, uh, with a name like Hupka, Polish, uh, you're not you're not old, uh, you're old Yankees or anything like that. But anyway, here, here are two buildings in, in, in the kitchen, L, um, who were, they were there historically. So the L, I'm going to conclude with with the uh, the little house. Uh, sorry, the the back house because the back house is really the key to the multiple ag agricultural operations of of the New England farm. And I'm, I'll conclude with why this is there. Lastly, the barn. Um, this is the the main agricultural building and all that, and and it's really quite simple in terms of the um, buildings uh, that were a part of this. There are two major types of of larger barns. There is the the English barn, and this is the barn that has the door in the side or the eave end of the um, uh, of the barn. Uh, this is a longer, this is about a five bay kind of barn, but most of them are three bays and, and a little shorter, uh, 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 more narrow than, than the one that's here. But the English barn, this barn was perfectly good for English people brought brought from uh, uh, the uh, England, uh, the old world, tithing barns. Have you ever seen the medieval? Uh, 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 church barns, uh, the, the same form, they were bigger uh, there, but anyway, English barn. George years, no problem, but in the early um, 18th, uh, 19th century, 1820, 1830, they changed to a new barn. And, and if you build a barn after 1830, this it looked like this one. You put the door in the gable end. Okay, so English barn to, to New England barn. I call this New England Barn because it's built in other parts of the country. It isn't called New England Barn, but we can call it that. But I just it's your nomenclature, right? In, in some ways, it's it's, it's a it's a main barn. <laughs> so, there you go. So here's here's the English Barn, and here's the New England Barn on this top. And there are lots of reasons why this made sense. Um, the, uh, uh, why it displaced the um, the English Barn. One of the primary ones is that you could expand this barn in terms of additional out the back, one, two, three, four, five, uh, out the back, without disconnecting the barn from the um, uh, the, the connected farm complex. The English barn can't expand so easily. Uh, you need multiple doors. Anyway, expansion, uh, they, whatever your interpretation, they chose this barn consistently in the connected farm arrangement over and over again. Barns are cool because they tell us about farmers, uh, about agricultural products. This is a there's a big barn tradition here, but main farmers always had small outbuilding barns. Okay, pig house, chicken house, ice house. Okay, corn crib. You know, all over the place. And some some have them all. Some have a few of them. But gradually, they they start to put the agricultural operations in, into one larger barn. As as they read about about Pennsylvania Germans in their big uh, uh, barns, and and they knew about the agricultural literature. And oh, something something's wrong here. Did any of you pick this up? What's what's wrong with this picture? Do you see this door? It's offset to the one side. We know that barn doors. Look at this other barn over here. Are located in the center of the, of the barn. Okay, but just like God made green apples. Okay, right. If you ask a kid to draw a picture of a barn, they know what's in the center. Well. Maybe that tells us that there was a little too much spiritist liquor 
that was served during this barn raising over here. And Josephus, who, you know, was the boy, you know, he kind of was, he misplaced it, right? Well, not quite. What you have here is an example of an early New England barn with a door in the gable end. And what we have here is a bay, a narrower bay on one side, and it's usually to the south side because that's where you put the cattle. So the cattle are in the narrow bay, and then the hay that you store from the fields is in the larger size. Early barn, you can pick that one up. That's in in, in your town of the, what else is that? That's what North Carolina and or surrounding. You have a couple of these, okay? And they're just, some are offset to one side. By the 20th century, this is about a 1900, a uh, little before 1900 barn. There's a standardization of barn uh, measurements and 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 uh, stick constructions. It comes in a little bit more and all that for lots of reasons. Um, it's standardized and the barn door becomes in the center. And so amaze your friends, you know, the non aggy friends and all that and say, my dear, Look at the look at the barn over there. It has its door offset to one side, and we know and understand that that is an early version of the New England barn. You knock your socks off of, of your um, uh, city folk friends by doing this, and and you'll be you'll be substantially correct. I tell that story to my students, and they of course they yawn, they understand, and all that, and they take notes and all that. And then I say, just to wake them up, I say, well, and of course they're architect students, and I say, well, here we have a farmer who designed a hotel. <gasps> How you like that? And they kind of giggle eh, the barn hotel. And I said, well, if you want you to think about, you know, how do you how would you design a, your hotel units because you're architects and all that? Now, some of you know the answer to this, and you know that why I'm giggling right now, because my students are, you know, think whatever they're thinking and all that. And then at some point I say, What kind of a hotel is this? Any of you out there? Most some of you do know very well what kind of a hotel. Chickens. It's a chicken hotel. Now, it's not every barn, but if you read the USDA, you, 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 United States Agricultural Literature of the period, you'll, you'll find 1920s, you, you'll handouts, it'll, it'll be, uh, Farmer Smith, should you, should you have an old barn that you're not using so much anymore, convert it to chicken production. And if you want your eggs to be as big as, you know, big sellers and all that, your chickens need sunlight. So, you know, thrifty Maine, New England way, take windows out of abandoned homes or something and put them into your barn and you'll be rich. Get it? Okay. And that's why we have uh, barns like this. I don't, I, I forget, Katie, you, you guys got chicken barn. You, do you have any that are still standing uh, that are in positions like this? Anyway, I will. And I start more and all that. Arkansas uh, got the chicken production and farmers in, in New England as they lost all their major crops lost chickens to um, by about 1930 or of course 35 or so. Um, I just gave a lecture um, uh, in uh, Vermont and uh, so I put this one in for my Vermont folks, but it applies to all of us uh, in uh, throughout New England. Many times you'll see a connected complex that looks like this. Uh, this is the Amos Brown farm in, in a, near New Hampshire line. Uh, sorry, near Massachusetts and South Vermont. And it'll go, you know, big house, little house, and back house, and whatever, and it'll stop. Of course, what this often is, is that the barn's destroyed. The barn has fallen down, and it's gone, and all of that. Um, for me, that's tragic, and, and it happens, and it's happened. Half, half, probably half uh, connected farms, uh, maybe a, a third, are, are in that condition. The, the, the main barn is gone uh, where, where it used to be. In this case, however, the, the barns used to be across the road. That happens for lots of farm re aggy reasons because the well is over there or the major fields are that side of the road. So anyway, there's different, there's slightly different traditions of where barns can be. And, and so you be alert to that um, uh, way of doing it. And here's red paint over here. Um, we don't usually do that. I'll end with talking about paint <laughs> and barns and all that. And so we'll we'll come to that later. So just try to think about red, red paint on barns. Okay, I'm, so I always have questions for my exam. So here's one of your first exam, you guys. Okay, so um, as we see here, here's a, here's a uh, barn here, but then what's on the roof? My architectural student said, it looks like a little temple. Oh, and what do we call it? And I ask you, what do we call it? C word? Cupola. Right? Uh -huh. 
Okay, that was the untruth button. It just went off. Um, it's not a cupola. Hey guys, here, here is a okay. This is Freeport. Uh, you know, so this is a uh, 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 this is a house. We do have a story associated with this cupola. That do you know that story? Can you? Can I? Can I do this? And so, what is the story of that cupola? I'm looking. I'm looking. The, the 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 ship captain's wife who goes up there and looks out to see to see the in, the whaling if the whaling boat's going to come in with her husband right okay. no um they build these in places that have anything to do with ships or anything like that and so it's a it's a mark I would say of industrial capitalism or you know these guys made good money he's a lawyer or something like that it's style it's all style you don't go up there to look at anything like that you put it on because you you have you read it, Italian books that had you know cupolas and belvedere's on the top of it, and that's why you did that. But what's this? Is that the same thing? What do we call that? Does this help? This is the it's the V word. It's a ventilator. Ventilator. Okay. Now, if you're from the city, you need this explanation. I I needed it too at one time too. If you pack green grass, hey, uh, hey, if we're going to talk about that tightly and early before it dries out in a barn and really tight, pack it tight, you can get spontaneous combustion. Okay, it'll explode into flames and you ventilate it. And so you ventilate it with things like that. Um, and that's the reason why you have that. You can have ventilators that are uh, along the top and smaller or, or way over here. I, I mean, tanks could ventilate with smaller holes in their building or smaller ventilators, but they wouldn't look so powerful. When you put that on top of your barn, you've made it. And uh, and I think they did it for the same reason. It's hard to justify that. So that's just Professor Upgrip giving you a wild theory. But ventilator, cupola, you may understand the difference. Eat your friends. Barns are cool because they tell us about structure. They're, they're heavy timber construction. This is a construction that that it comes over from England. It's ubiquitous across all northern New England where you had trees. Okay, um, uh, it's heavy timber. It's all wood construction, um, and it's a pen and tongue and a mortise hole, and it's held together by wooden pins or called panels in the like, 17th, 18th century, and things like that. And and um, it, it it made sense. Okay, and it made sense for New Englanders, and they kept it. Even though the house gradually got balloon frame, the barn kept uh, uh, for lots of good reasons coming up is why they kept uh, this uh, heavy timber construction. Heavy timber construction also, this is a brace, okay? And it tells you, you know, that it stiffens and so the barn doesn't fall over because of the, the, the idea of the brace. Oh, it's a nice structural element that actually uh, visually uh, tells you what it does um, to buy its presence. Here's a barn raising in Northern Connecticut. And, you know, I, I, I wish I could use a Maine and, and, and New Hampshire and Vermont example of that, of more, more in my area there. But, you know, uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of barn raisings in New England in the 18th, 19th century and all that. And we have about two or three photos that are good photos of that you know it'd be like why are you photograph photograph grass growing would you want to do that anyway it was so common they didn't photograph and all that but here we see connecticut um and they're raising the barn it made sense for farmers who were somewhat isolated that they could work two or three builders or so could work uh, at a time um slowly um and pre-assemble uh, the barn um uh, as we see there and then in one glorious day the farm community comes together and puts it together. <laughs> barn raising. Um, the, the barn raising is, is the, one of the high points of, of farm life. Um, these are these are people who don't go to Las Vegas in the winter and all that. And so uh, this is an important time. And it's an important time which people get together, have a good time, and do good work. Which is an interesting way to come, to come together always, as they always did. The people who we do have pictures about barn raising are the Pennsylvania Germans. This is the German side of my family, central Pennsylvania. So here's a barn raising, um, and they're, they have pike poles. They can pull, you push, and then you push it up. You can see this portion of the, of the bench, they call it, being pushed up in place in both of those photos. If you're a big farmer, you had a big spread. Over here, you have a big spread. To, and if you're a small farmer, you probably have a good takeout lunch or something like that. But anyway, 
a time of celebration, a time to get together. This may be the point that, uh, uh, that I point out uh, to some of my, uh, uh, usually it's the males in the audience who really know a lot about construction. And I, I ask some of my carpenter friends, you know, I say, why aren't these people up here? There are about 10 farmers that are up here as is bent being raised. They give me answer like the, 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 the business master and why you need this pulley and all that stuff. I say, oh, no, no, no. That's not the reason why they're up there. The reason why they're up there is because this is one of the most exciting day of their life. And this was the coolest thing, the, the unimaginable and all that. And that's why they, you can see the farmer's wife there up there and said, uh, Siegfried, uh, you're going to bust your head. And so Siegfried doesn't eat. He's, he's OK. And all that. He has some spiritist liquors, I guess. And he has a good time. And they did. Uh, and they did at, at barn residence in, in North Yarmouth. You know. Um, this is now a question for, you know, just to think about, and we can, it's husband and wives now, you can both join in. Let's say you you pass this, this is in North, this is in Bridgeton, North Bridgeton, uh, sorry, uh, near Denmark, um, a, a farm. Okay, but let's say it's in North Yarmouth and you pass it, and you know that this is a Smith place, and you know the Smiths have been there for 18 generations, or anyway, it's all Smiths, okay? And you go by there in your car and your kids are in the back seat and they say, mommy, daddy, or grandma, grandparents, who built Farmer Smith's barn? And what do you say? Well, you could say, I don't know, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe you do, but if you turn back and say, or Smith. Well, okay. I want to add to that a little bit. Did Farmer Smith help with the barn raising? Probably may have hauled the wood and the water and all, a lot of things like that. Did he have the technical skills and knowledge to put that thing together? No. Okay. Neither did farmers throughout America because what we have is professional barn builders. You know, they may be a farmer, but they, they do professional work and all that. And that's what happens here. And they are the ones responsible for the barn. So although you say Farmer Smith built it, it means he paid for it, it's his land. So that we, our nomenclature doesn't give us a, a way to handle it, and it doesn't give us a way to credit these guys. Um, the German farm that I was just showing you, he's down here someplace. There he is. Okay. Calling the shots. Every, every This was done this way. We don't give credit to these people, and we should. And so anyway, there's a there's a cast of, of very professional people. And, you know, some of you home builders, you know, this is hard. You, 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 don't, you don't do this alone. And they didn't. And whatever you do and all that. I love this picture over here because there's a you know, team of, of barn builders and all that. And I ask you, as I ask my students, I say, which one of these is the master builder? Builder A, B, C, or E? What do you choose? And the, the kids, the, the, the students, um, pick or all that. And I say, but I think we know something about that and it'll help you. What's he holding? This is a square, okay? And the person who holds the square, it's like, hold, who's the guy who holds the computer? Anyway, and this is the guy. You need a square like that to, to, to make the measurements and calculations and all that. And I presume that he's the one, the one doing that. I don't know exactly, okay? The builder. I think he's the air, air apprentice um, and for the on this team and all that. So farmers in North Yarmouth and all throughout New England are usually portrayed as individualistic. You know, they they got it together. They've done a lot. Okay. It's it's a kind of proud personal history and all that. They, they stand alone sometime uh, with their farm wives and all that as we as we discover more about them and all that. But you know, they they don't mix a lot. Um, uh, they've done it themselves in, in many ways. Well, yes, they've done that. But the kind, also the history that we usually don't tell enough about is the way they share. Now, I, I, this is going to be a, a socialistic group or a bunch of communists or anything like that. But they shared a lot. And here, so here's a, a typical uh, farm scene um, uh, and from the diary. And so I've read lots and lots of diaries and a, a typical diary account, maybe it would happen 10, 15, 20 times in a diary or maybe more, and some of them are more elaborate, is a diary entry that goes something like this. So Farmer Smith here says in his diary, um, um, uh, Farmer Blake comes over, uh, uh, Rufus Blake 
comes over to my place and we shear sheep in the morning. There's a little sheepy down there. They're they're working on them. Okay, they're she sheep. And then he says, in the afternoon, I went over to Blake's place and we sheared sheep, sheared his sheep. And then, he, or sometimes we're just abbreviate that and he'll say, changing work. He changed, exchange is the older English uh, term uh, for that. And it'll be over and over, change work, change work. They did change work. They, they share tools a lot. Tools are very important. So there's a lot of tool sharing and all that. There's a lot of ways they come together. It's not often portrayed. It makes sense. And they did that. They, they, they as long as they were, as well as being independent and all that, they did a lot of this kind of sharing. There's other kinds of sharing too. Um, here are women sharing. They also share. They come together for huskings and uh, bees and things like that. Well, interestingly, like barn raising, you come together, you have a good time, but you do work. Interesting. This is a scene from Yarmouth. Over over here, and maybe you can help me find it where that. I don't think we located where that was, but maybe you, you guys can find it out over here. So this is one of your scenes um, of women um, uh, talking here, but uh, there's a tradition of that mutuality and, and sharing too. In the winter, Tom, you, you want to? Hey, Tom. Many farmers in the winter. That uh, that that photograph of the two women that is the yeah. lane in North Yarmouth, and there's Skyline Farm in the distance. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Look at Gorgeous photograph. So we know where Do that know is. Who the women are? Do we know who the women are? Hey, Skyline. Do we know who the women are? Um, <laughs> Keith says probably Good. the Smiths. <laughs> okay. Good call, yeah, Keith. Smith's barn. There we go. Okay. <laughs> great, great. Um, so here's a here's a wood hauling scene. Um, as you'll hear, uh, farmers have to have other kinds of income besides crops and. Wood, 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 hauling wood, lumbering uh, was was always a big one in the winter. And the idea of mutuality, you want to you want to do logging alone? Well, you don't do that. You don't do it alone. You do you do it together because they could die easily or something like that. So anyway, mutuality, people get together. And also, I'd like to emphasize people get together in hard times. They always did in times of sickness and childbirth and death. You come together. There's no Republicans, there's no Democrats. You get together and, and 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 you do that. It's a wonderful tradition. I wish we had more of that and all that, but this is your folk. And 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 they did that consistently. I, there is a reason why connection ma made sense in the winter. It's a it's a you know, it, and it, it's a good one. Um it's that usually um uh farmers in a connector range to, to uh Put the door yard. This is the yard of the um, uh, of the doors for vehicles and people. And here's the barnyard, the yard for animals over here. You needed to have this dry and and mostly uh, clean in in the early spring. You got a wet door yard. You can't do. You can't run your vehicles there. You lose a couple week uh, of of agricultural operation. You're gone. So it, it it was a very important to have of uh, the, the the cold winters winds and and the snow and, and all and the wetness on that side and more dryness here on this side. So a reason for connected farms. And then I would say, but farmers in other other parts of the country had the same conditions, you know, easily um, more snow easily, um, uh, uh, lots of places, and they never connected. So it's not it, it was a benefit, but it was it's not the reason they made connected farms. I'm, a, I'm an architectural professor, and I know style. I'm supposed to know style anyway. And I can tell you about great connected farm buildings that look like the ones here. And maybe a little side note here is I'm emphasizing big house, little house, back house, uh, barn of farms. The, the major income is, is farm production and all that. I could easily talk about the same thing about city, town, connected, house to stable. So it's, like it's now these stables in the 19th century also had a pig and a chicken. I think they were like connected farms, but they didn't get their primary income through farming. They were either you know, mechanics or things like that. And so here we have these are houses mostly in Bridgeton uh, over here. So here's the federal style, and here's the Greek revival with a little Italianate. Getting excited, okay? And here's Italianate with a, a Belvedere or a, a cupola on top of it, another cupola, but this is in the French style. Uh, uh, looking good. Uh, gothic, we know gothic dormers. Also, you don't want to make a gothic uh, farm uh, yellow. You want to make it uh, subtle gothic colors usually. And um, shingle style. 
Okay, I can give you a lecture. We could talk about it. I think some of you would be wowed by that. I'm wowed by that in some ways. But we wouldn't be talking about most farmers. And that's what I'm talking about today, about average farmers and, and popular uh, uh, culture. Most farmers built in a style like this, which we don't have a name for. Architects like me, uh, we usually stylistically might call it uh, a Greek revival. We do that because the, there's a capital with this column here. It looks like Greece and Rome and all. This return, do you see it? Where a return is where the roof goes down and it returns. That's part of a classical vocabulary. There's little bits and pieces of that, and it's all painted white. This modified style. Classical vernacular is what I would call it, but they really, we don't. New England village style, that's cool. You can, you can call it that. We don't really have a name for it because it's so common. That's what most farmers did. You could say, however, that, well, farmers, they chose it, but they didn't really understand architectural style. or They didn't, weren't educated enough. Well, okay. In my book, in my last uh, chapter or two, I, I focus on Tobias Walker. He lives in Kennebunk. He has a great diary. I know what he did every day of his life because he told me. He goes by this house about maybe three or 400 times in his life. Now, you, you recognize this house, some of you, you people here? And been down to Kenny Bunk. I used to live in Kenny Bunk. This is the famous wedding cake house. On the, if you go down to the port to see the bushes at the port, Kenny Bunk port, you pass this house, okay? It's a famous one and all that. It's done like a Milan cathedral in the Gothic style and all that. Tobias Walker knew about this house, and I imagine he thought it was pretty silly, or it wasn't the style he was going to build for, for a farmer in New England. So they knew about other styles, but they continually chose this classical vernacular style to ornament or uh, you would say decorate because farmers, that's too, too uh, uh, decorated a, a term here uh, to finish uh, their houses and their barns. We'll get to that in just a second. So it's standard. Uh, they develop that and farmers generally choose that. So. Why did Northern New England farmers connect their houses and their bars? Now I've given you more general ideas, but now I'm going to more focus about what are the particular reasons that they've done that. I put this little sidebar over here because this is Aroostook County, a farmer in Aroostook County. I mean, if anybody wanted to connect their houses and their barns together, these main farmers uh, should have done that, but they didn't. They went single crop, as you guys couldn't do, and they didn't do connected farms and all that. So that's put that into your uh, uh, why they made connected farm uh, interpretation. So some more specific reasons about making uh, connected farms that wasn't, um, didn't have to do with the snow. You've seen this. Now remember, I'm trying to reinforce that. This is the only part of the country. This is where connected farms are. You know, does it get colder here? No, I don't think so. What this map could show us is this one here. And here we are in the center of the farm universe, where over 60% of farms became connected at some point in their lifetime and, and all that. And it, it's, it it's, um, bans out to lesser and lesser percentages as we go north, as you go south. The, um, uh, the interstate line over here is the one of the line that you, you, Massachusetts farmers didn't go down. And the ridge of the blue uh, of the Green Mountains here in Vermont, I was just there, is really the slope going west uh, to the uh, Lake Champlain and the Hudson Valley. No connected farms there. So there is a really tight universe where connected farms are. But more important than just density of that, this is a map of culture. And you guys are English, okay? I mean, I'm Polish, okay? And so it comes in German and all that. But 95% of farmers in New England are, and more, more than that probably, are English. And there's some French, but they don't go to the farms. They certainly don't build these farms. Little poles coming up the uh, connected about No way English people did this. Now, I've just lectured in Iowa, okay? And I've talked to Iowa farmers, okay? And, you know, I've... Uh, in, in that time, um, an Iowa farmer down the road would have a a Swiss farmer next to a German farmer, next to an Irish farmer, uh, next to, you get it, okay? In other parts of the country, it's a Moorish farmer, okay? 
this is the only area of the country where you have such a concentration, except maybe you know in the, uh, in the hollow in, in, in North Carolina or something like that, where you have this kind of density of, of a culture, the same. And in this same culture, what would happen? I know you had a Methodist and, and there's some congregationalists and all, there's some differences and all that, but really, like, there's a unity of cultural you know, development and they choose similar things. And when an idea kicks off and grows, it's probably gonna make sense to a whole lot of people. And it did, and the Connected Forum did that way too. So that's part of it. Doesn't explain everything, explains a little. Explains why it's so uniform. And boy, is it not uniform in the rest of the country that way. So the other things happen. Part of my research was looking at other um, parts of, of New England, and I did. And here's a, and, and looking for Connected Forums. How early was that? So here's the morning in Blue Hill Village. This is a rather famous um, uh, paint. Jonathan Fisher, he's a minister. He, he's good with musical instruments and he paints and all that. He's a uh, Renaissance guy and all that. No connected forms in his painting as in other paintings and in other research that are not out there before 1830 or, or something like that. So it wasn't early, it happens later, how come? The one thing that was out there that offers a, a precedent that farmers did know about, but didn't choose, the precedent that we say, here's Beverly, Massachusetts, a painting, okay, the big house and a stable. Here's Kenny Bunk, where I used to live over here. And uh, this was gone by the time I got there. But um, uh, on, on this city house, there's a big stable. So you see that there's a, a, a stable here. Uh, so the house to the barn um uh whole house to the stable there this is is what we call a palladian um uh design um that's a term for palladio the italian ar architect there were there were in a european literature of grand houses of uh, metal buildings there's this out there monticello and mount vernon are connected farms if you want to think about that grand elite uh, kinds of houses so that's out there as a possible reference out there and it continues to be um, so it's out there. Most farmers did not choose this. Okay. And so, but it's out there. So some of you might can look at that, um, as a possible source. And so why did Northern New England farmers connect their houses and their barns? Now I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm not going to be a professor and give you 25 theory, which guys like me usually do. I'm going to give you the answer. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, Katie, do we have a drum roll? Uh, do we, do we have any trumpets? Okay, 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 Katie. Okay, well, uh, um, this is the time to do it. Yeah, okay, that, that's it. I, I like that. Okay, because now Professor Hupka is going to give you the answer that you've been waiting for. Some of you some snow skeptics. So here we come. Hey, Katie, did you switch? Did you switch my slide? What? What is this? I, I didn't. You know, I, I was going to give you the answer, but did you switch this? I mean, this is Minnesota and Kansas, for crying out loud. Is this the wrong slide? No, it's not. What it is is the slide that tells you what happened and that New Englanders would have to respond to, okay? So just to rub this in a little bit to you Yankee farmers over here, this is a Kansas cornfield, okay? This is uh, two or three fields of two, two or three farmers this is more corn than North Yarmouth would produce in 10 years. Okay. This amount of chaff from wheat and all, all that is later, but earlier they did it later. Are you guys going to compete against this? The answer is no, you are not going to compete against this, but you tried. Okay. So what, what are you going to do? You know, who are you going to call? Okay. This is so that's a, that's a, that's a tough question. What you do in this situation is develop a mixed farming and home industry economy. And that's what they did. With their backs to the wall, and because they were cut out of all these um, uh, developments, and uh, the, what I should have shown here, uh, talked about here is dates. Uh, sorry, I go back here a little bit. There's a date associated with this. It just didn't happen. The date that you really want to understand and that really hurt uh, people in North Yarmouth and throughout New England is, is 1825. Any historians out there? The Erie Canal was built. Erie Canal 
Why 1835? Ten years later, you guys in North Yarmouth couldn't sell your wheat in the market in Portland because you were undercut by wheat coming off the Erie Canal from Ohio, Indiana, and all that. Wheat, that's your cash. You did you have done wheat as a cash crop since Philip the Conqueror, William the Conqueror. Since Adam and Eve. Okay, you've done wheat for, for, for your major cash, and then you get knocked out of it. And then you get then you then you got sheep. Remember the sheep craze? Some of you guys know about that, you know, 1820s, 1830 or so, or 1840. And then and then Australia kicks in and then the tariff and you can't grow. You you can grow, you can make it for your wife, or she can make a sweater for you, but you know, you ain't gonna make a living by that. What are you gonna do? So what you did and what the New England farmers had to do is they had to diversify. Now, they always had been diversified. As you know, they grew little apples, little corn, little cream, little, you know, all the stuff and all that. And that was, you know, subsistence. But gradually in the 19th century uh, progressed. They had to develop. If you want to farm machinery, you got to have some. And, you know, they were into this economy that wanted to go single crop, single something, but they couldn't do it. So what they developed and can develop is what agriculturalists called mixed farming and home industry. You should understand mixed farming. That's a little bit of this, little eggs, little little chickens, uh, little pigs, uh, little cow, little milk, and, and all of them. And guess what farm structure works really good for a mixed farming home industry operation? Connected farm. Home industry needs a little explanation because that's just anything else you could do that was really not associated with the farm. Farmers in other parts of the country, I, I can tell you, are not doing this. Uh, Iowa farmers I talked to, by 1840, when they settled there, they went to corn and hogs. Today, corn and hogs, okay? They could go, they could go a single crop, and they did, and they made a living by that. You guys couldn't do that. You had to diversify, and you did it pretty well. And here's four farmers. There are four different farmers, and this is near Barry's Mills. It's just north and west of you guys. Um, and there is a shovel handle. And you see how they got a stack of shovel handles? They're going to take it to the local mill, get paid, you know, two dollars or something like that. That's that's going to make it. That's going to make their connected farm work all the year because of this industry. You had to do that to survive farming. And piggly piggly, average farmer does the same thing and survives for a little while. And so, you know, you develop a home industry of some kind. You've seen these uh, more in Massachusetts. Uh, by the side of the road, you can have a cooper shop. That's a farmer, you know, developing a side you know, business or something like that. Often that cooper shop would be in the in the back buildings and all that. Here's another Pennybunk farm. Here's a farmer. Here's his proud wife. Uh, here's his daughters. He's probably the maid over here. He makes, he makes some money, too. He has corn, chickens, pigs, and all that sort of thing. But watch this, a carriage. He makes his carriage in this shed, which is an extension of his back buildings. That's a little more exotic than most farmers. Carriage making is really sophisticated, but that's what they had to do, and that's what they did. I looked at the ledgers of hundreds of farmers somehow to try to get it. The farmers who made it always had another income besides the standard agricultural uh, products that they normally had. You don't do this in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> the pigs pay the bills, okay? So you couldn't do a cash crop, but you could do multiple crops. So what happened was that the agriculturalists um, in, in New England, they said, uh, I, 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 this is a, a, it's a, such a great quote, okay? So a model uh, farm building for a main farmer, okay? And it goes something like this. He says, Farmer Smith, could your barn and your house be located such that you could connect them together, you would find it to be a more efficient model. Look at this, by a main farmer's wife. Nobody else in the agricultural business is, is talking about what the wife says in, during this period, but they did here, because no, they knew that farmers in other parts of the country weren't doing this, and they had to couch it in, this in some ways, but they also knew there was no other alternative for New England farmers except this mis mixed farming. And they recommended it. And the connected farm was an ideal collection of buildings to house this mixed operation. I can talk about why that makes sense, but that takes a while. We'll, if you want some questions at the end. So they whitened, straightened, and cleaned that farm landscape all over and over again. 
and made, and part of that cleaning up was making a connected farm. It was the symbol of farming wherewithal, of making it about an, a, a new model of farming. It's, it seems antique today, but it wasn't then. And so Yankees built spectacularly. These are, you know, your neighbors and all. Uh, this is a spectacular L and there's a spectacular barn, and that's what you guys did. This is a scene from Yarmouth, uh, I, I believe. And so this is a good one, the one, one down here. So what you see is Yarmouth farmers getting together. This is probably, uh, I'm guessing here in 19, 18, 1910 or something like that. Maybe you could you know, find out. There's horse teams and ox teams here. And so a typical farm diary quote would be, my son Josephus takes our oxen down to the Blake place and helps move, this is a schoolhouse, the schoolhouse across the road and connects it with his, his barn buildings or something like that. They could move buildings. This is important because some of you could say, well, that, that may be fine, uh, connected farm, but only for wealthy farmers. And it would be, it, would, it is, if it's a lot of buildings, but an average farmer, you know, they dragged around thing wood every winter's day of their life. They, this is a piece of cake. There's no foundation balls. There's no plumbing. Move a building around, make a connected farm. Pretty easy, available to all. And they did it. I love this one. This is Bethel. Go up to Bethel Main Street. It's still there. Okay, here's a Cape Cod house. Look at it. Here's the front door. Here's two windows on the side. There's a side door over here. Cape Cod house over here. But look at it. It's up in the air, 12 to 14 feet here. These are railway ties that you can see here. Do you see how the railway ties? Here's a can below here. This is a house jacked up in the air. Okay, you got it? There it is. Keep your eye on it. There's your Cape Cod house. So Main Street and Bethel, you got a Cape Cod house in the air, and they built a Victorian parlor underneath it and all that. Isn't that cool? It's these, these guys are evangelical builders and all that, and they did that all over New England, and farmers did it too. So in conclusion, I'd say the reason they made connected farms was their backs were to the wall, couldn't reform their farming uh, to be single crops, which they all tried for, and they chose a farm system that facilitated their mixed farming home, in, home industry operation that was the only viable option and that Connected Farm is a really good organization uh, for, for doing that. Snow is there, you know, maybe maybe a farmer with in old age would limp from the house in the barn, but uh, ever, far, ever far, follow a farmer out in the winter? <laughs> I have, but I'm frozen to, to prove it. But, but they're out there every winter's day of their life, and they, they connect to be modern. They modernized. wasn't the way modernism would, go, would, would, would finally go. It's ultimately a hard story to tell. I've had the same interview with steel workers in the shadow of their old abandoned mill in Ohio. And that's a tough story, the abandonment of a way of life. And ultimately, a farm for farmers, this story, because they at some point went out of farming, is the story of farm abandonment. And this, this style of building, quite radical, is looking a little radical in some ways. And so telling the story of the snow is, you know, what you tell stories, of course, and all that. And it's a pretty complex story, but it's it, it's 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 your story uh, in some ways. So it's it's a story of reform. Um, uh, this is great architecture by any standard. And this is the story of 50 years. So I've told you the 50 year story, 1850 to 1900. And in 1900, you guys finally got your cash source or crop or whatever. Finally, okay. So connected farms into the 20th century, another drum roll. You guys got milk. Now you always had milk, but you finally got bulk milk, okay, at some point. Other places do cheese and cheese and butter and all. You guys go to, it's the rail that, that comes in refriger, refrigerated cars that goes off to Portland and uh, Boston and, and things like that. I would say generally, 90% of farms that made it into the made it through the 20th century and into your era survived because they went to milk as the as the dominant cash crop. Uh, there, there are exceptions. There's some apple farms and all that, but but it's milk. They went milk. Is, these are Holsteins. Aren't they beautiful? This is the, their most beautiful house. And they saved they saved Maine and uh, 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 North Yarmouth farms uh, into the 20th century. The connected farm didn't work if you have 
larger and larger farms. If you go down the Connecticut Valley, or farms down the Connecticut Valley, some of the richer farm zones uh, in um, New Hampshire and Vermont, um, they didn't do, they don't do connected farms. When you get a hundred head of cattle, hundred head of cattle, your manure pile is as big as your house. No connected farms. You see how the scale, which they couldn't go to, or you wouldn't go to connected farms. They had a smaller scale. Connected farms works for them. That's why they went there. I think you have a style of architecture that is is beautiful and unique in the country, and it is unique in the country, as you saw. Um, and done that. I've emphasized the uh, uh, the house to barn connection, a little more radical idea, and one that uh, uh, Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont farmers chose was to connect their house and the barn together in the connective arrangement. But they put the architectural style of the house onto the barn. Not the full blown version, but there now in 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 Iowa, you know, the, the farmers look at me and say, "Well, you know, you know, the the house has the same style as, as the barn. Well, that's not, you know, you paint your barn red and your house white, and they're different conceptually. Has God made green apples, right? Well, different farms, different universe, and all that. In New England, it worked on a smaller scale, and anyway." It's what was chosen. Well, obviously, some farmers can put the architectural style on their barn and then have the back and the sides be shingles and all that in black. But it's it's no other place does anything close to that. You do it here. You have an architecture that is individually designed by individual farmers. That's what's really cool. All farmers design their farmsteads in some ways. They locate their barns, but they weren't like this. They weren't. They don't make an architectural like this. If I could just show you. Uh, this is a farm. Uh, I forget. Uh, it's uh, 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 west of Denmark in some ways. Over here. anyway, I'm an architect. This is a beautiful. This is a beautiful piece of architecture. Okay, architecture of the house, architecture of the barn. Um, this is this is uh, as, as good as you get. Interestingly, uh, farmers would, would never say this is a. As I would say, as an architect, you know, this is a beautiful stand of buildings. They don't use words like that. It's not a working class way of doing it. Nineteen. 19- Century, century, a good stand of buildings. The idea of function and looking good at, at some point it came into the literature. That's what they did. That's what you guys got. I I wish we had a word for it. The only word that we usually is vernacular or folk architecture or folk art. Folk art is usually done by eccentric kind of folk and all that. But this art of the people is done by average farmers and was of a high quality. Anyway. It's your great art. You have great. Here's two more slides. The last ones I'm have up here. This is Bethel. This is what happens in a standard way as a standard story of the connected farm. This farmer um, had an old Cape Cod house, and he ripped out that fireplace chimney and put a stove chimney in. He ripped out those nine over six windows. I hope I have some antique folks over there who, you know, who out of this house and put in modern two over two windows. Feel the modernism, okay? Okay, and he had, he had an old barn. He put up a new barn over here, and then in the last gesture over here, he takes his building, which is about from here to here. He drags it into line from someplace else, and farm. Okay, this happened over and over again. This is your story. Okay, plant some maple trees and all that. He's a real proud guy. And look at this. What's here? Rocks. Have you ever seen a main? farm with rocks in the field like this in outside the front, the dooryard or the front yard? The answer is no. They were there. You see that tenacity? I'll give you a quote. I love this quote from my diary. It, it's it's so beautiful. This is this is Tobias Walker. You know, he died his years of, of a, a diary. And, and, and one diary entry in about 1890 or so, I, I forget the exact date, he says in his diary, my son Edwin and I go down to the South Fields and we plow or, and we move rocks um, from the field, rocks that my grandfather and my father plowed around for a hundred years. You could, you could have plowed around those rocks. Uh, you could have left them. You feel the spirit? Okay, you get rid of them, okay? There's an evangelical spirit of improvement. They had this spirit. Picture of improvement was the connected form. Last slide. 
there's no pictures of, of average farmers. Just, you know, it's just, it's set up or whatever. This is the best I can get, okay? One of the great stories in New England um, about agriculture is those who stayed and those who left. You're not going to subdivide a main farm, okay? It's just, you don't do that, okay? Some people are going to, mainly, uh, 12 kids, 11 are going to have to leave. Okay? So there are those who leave. And there are those who stay. And those who stayed, they could have left too, right? Some did. You could you could give up, you could have given up. Give up. You know, these are the guys who didn't give up at Gettysburg or Antietam. You know, the, the idea of just, you know, throwing it away, they didn't do that. They dug in. They should have maybe seen the future, but they didn't. They made the connected farms and they made it work for a while. It's a beautiful history. It's your history. You know, go love it. Uh, preserve your connected farms. Thank you very much. Good day. Can you hear me? Yeah, here we go. Thank you so much. This, uh, there are some things that you said during your talk that just all of a sudden, ding, 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 began to make sense to me. Uh, the most recent one and what you said was the milk train because we have pictures of the milk train of people bringing their milk to East North Yarmouth and loading up their milk and away it went and that's what helped keep things going here in this town. I had not really made that connection. Thank you, Tom. Tom is um, offering yeah. to uh, answer any questions that anyone has. The only caveat to that is that you have to speak in the microphone um, or else the recording um, will not record what your questions are and Tom won't be able to hear it. So if, um, are there any questions from the audience? I'm going to hand the microphone over to you. Here you go. What was the sequence of building these uh, structures in, in the early years? Would you first build a barn to protect your, your economic investment, your, your crops that you brought in and the animals and live with them? until the economic viability was established, then build a small house because you wanted, didn't want to live that close to the manure pile. And then you wanted maybe a little bit more space, so you built the big house. And then can, what, would, if, what, what do you know about the, can, the sequencing here? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is one area where hundreds of, of, of uh, New England, northern New England towns, have at least one little story about that, about the first settlers who had the first winter and the second winter and things like that, but usually the first winter. It's 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 tough. Um, usually, uh, some people um, uh, uh, make a shelter before settlement. And so the husband goes usually uh, a year before and, and constructs a, a lean-to or things like that. But for after the first settlers come, they usually sometimes sit someone else's farm for a couple of days as they gather leaves and rocks and things like that and 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 timber to house themselves and the animals so there's both a housing the animals and house itself this is pretty tough mosquito weather um it's it's a there's a brutal history of that as a town developed there's there's there are ways of coming that new settlers developed there the sequence is is different for different people uh, and here's wealth is, is the factor some some farmers <laughs> Uh, they came in, and in and, and the first couple of years, they had other people build, uh, because there's now uh, carpenters and people in town, the whole farmstead, uh, the, the early English barn, separate, uh, and early house, and, and usually, uh, often, log cabin, uh, and kind, everyone understood and did how to do that. So, I would say, I, I've looked, I've, I've read a uh, hundred uh, different accounts that have variations on, on this Um uh, it, it's tough uh, by almost any standard. Uh, sheltering the animals at some point for the winter uh, becomes uh, becomes important for the production of, of milk. Uh, animals die too. So uh, uh, it, it, this is out there in terms, sometimes that's glorified a little bit, you know, the, the ancient cabin and all that. You have to be a little careful about early accounts of heroic accounts, but it was hard. And, and there are at least that portion, it has been recorded uh, uh, many times. Uh, I don't know your history in, in your in your towns around there.
Tom, I think, I think we have an audience that's learned so much in the last hour. Thank you so much for everything that you've told us. And um, just as a personal connection, when you talk about Tobias Walker and reading the diaries of Tobias Walker, I worked at Maine Historical Society when I first moved to Portland in, the, um, in 1979, and I remember Tom Hubka reading fire, uh, farm diaries in the reading room at Maine Historical Society, and I do remember you falling asleep over them too, Tom, I just have to say. <laughs> But I'm glad that you uh, persisted with your research, and we have a beautiful book and so much research um, that came of it. So thank you so much again on behalf of all of our combined historical societies. Thank you. It was a pleasure to come home again to uh, uh, a place so much. Thank you.